As we continue with chapter one of the cell, we'll look to the next section of 1.2, experimental models in cell biology. We'll compare and contrast the differences and similarities between yeast and E. coli. We'll talk about the models for studying plant and animal development. And we'll take a look at vertebrates in close proximity, as well as deeper understanding. And summarize principles of animal cell culture, why it's necessary and why it's a good idea for research. And explain how we use viruses uh, trying to understand cell biology. For studying prokaryotic cell biology in different types of metabolic pathways, probably the best or most well-known bacteria that we use is Escherichia coli, otherwise known as E. coli. Um, e. coli rapidly divides. We get most divisions within 20 minutes under optimal conditions, and they've been grown on all different types of media. In this one, you see it on what's called an auger. Uh, you can add different types of nutrients to the auger or other types of uh, things to challenge the uh, E. coli and see if it can adapt or mutate into uh, conducting different types of pathways and see what kind of challenges it can overcome. Uh, because of the size of its genome, it's relatively easy to study and break down and try and uh, identify certain types of genes or which ones you're trying to target is relatively simple because you have such a rapid change in the E. coli from generation to generation. Now, conversely, when we try and look at a eukaryotic cell, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae is our best culprit. So this is a eukaryotic unicellular organism. It doesn't quite rapidly uh, divide as quickly as the E. coli, because E. coli is 20 minutes. The uh, yeast here is going to divide every tw uh, two hours or so. Uh, but it's very important to look at different fundamental processes of different eukaryotic cells. In particular, you see that the nucleus center here is easily seen. You can see, again, the nucleus over through here. So it's very important to um, to identify these trigger areas so you can look at different types of um, metabolic and fundamental processes found in eukaryotes, which includes DNA replication, transcription, RNA processing, protein sorting, all the Golgi apparatus, and so on and so forth. So we move up in more complex organisms, which includes the multicellular eukaryotic organisms. This one here called Centeropatitis elegans is a nematode worm. So scientists use this particular organism uh, as very easy to manipulate different types of genes, check certain pathways of embryonic development, and also check to see if there's certain types of genes that are analogous to our own uh, development. Uh, so it's become very useful in trying to trigger uh, the pathways for certain types of development and see how certain disease patterns uh, can occur. Here we see another uh, very common organism you find in the laboratory known as Drosophila melanogaster. This is your common fruit fly. Uh, we've been using these uh, in genetics labs for a, a long period of time, since I think the 50s or even the uh, 40s. Um, very important because it has a very quick life cycle, has a reproductive cycle of about two weeks. Um, you can grow, I believe, from larvae to pupae to a full adult in two or three days. So you can crossbreed these pretty easily uh, for certain types of factors, like for eye color, for uh, wing length, uh, color of the abdomen, so on and so forth. But this has been very important for helping us map uh, out vertebrate uh, body planning uh, even though this is an invertebrate, uh, this organism, along with um, the C. elegans, has given us a pretty good map of which genes can trigger, uh, say, development of, say, an eye versus development, say, like a certain extremity, uh, whether it be an invertebrate or a vertebrate. So uh, these have been very easy to take care of in the lab, uh, very easily crossbred, uh, very easy to manipulate different types of genes as well. That has uh, given us great strides in uh, developmental genetics. And of course, for plants, we have the Arabidopsis thaliana, which is also a very uh, small flowering plant, very easy to take care of in the lab. Uh, very important because it has a number of unique genes, about 15,000 or so, uh, that can be adapted or modified to uh, check for different types of pathways or different types of growth patterns all throughout plants. Next, we look at different types of vertebrates. So these are ones that have a spine, uh, have a bony structure to them have an endoskeleton versus an exoskeleton you see with the invertebrates like the insect we saw before. So certain types of organisms are especially uh, used in the laboratory for ease of use. This is what's known as a zebrafish. The zebrafish, uh, one important aspect of the zebrafish is the uh, embryo on the left-hand side here is transparent, and so it's very easy to see different types of systems grow through different stages. Uh, these are grown outside the, uh, the womb of the mother, uh, so they're very easily accessible. Uh, and from the full reproductive cycle, it only takes about three or four months, so you can have a pretty good yield of a particular set of zebrafish. Now, the reason why we look at the, um, let's say, differently developed, I say less developed, differently developed organisms like this here, 
This is, of course, uh, gives an idea of what is analogous uh, to the human development. So many of you have probably seen at different stages of an embryo uh, as it grows to full maturity in the womb. Uh, if you notice, uh, so it does look uh, almost like a fish when in the first couple of weeks or first couple of months of development. And we have certain types of genes that actually turn off to uh, prevent any kind of uh, gills that would normally uh, be formed, as we see here on a fish. So judging at the or looking at the particular sequence of how certain things are turned on or turned off by genes gives great insight to human development. Uh, even though there are two vastly different types of organisms, they oftentimes will follow the same pathway up to a certain point uh, when something will differentiate into a new uh, type of development of an organ or different types of cell uh, or differentiate into something else entirely. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, embryonic development just for a few moments here. So as you can see here on the fish, you kind of get uh, a good idea on this embryonic uh, zebrafish, where the head is, where the tail is, where the spine is. You can see the spine as you see right down through here. So this is analogous to different vertebrae that we find in other vertebrates as well. So what happens is you get what's known as differentiation of different types of cells. So as this embryo develops, um, the cells will differentiate into different types of cells. that may be, say, a nerve cell or a bone cell or a cartilage cell or even a muscle cell. Each one is going to be determined to do a certain type of function uh, and does not revert back to its original state. So once it's dedicated as, say, a muscle, it's going to develop into a muscle cell and nothing else. Uh, once it develops into a nerve, then it'll develop into a nerve and nothing else. It doesn't revert back. Now, stem cells are going to be a little bit different. Stem cells will always stay in the embryonic stage, uh, and we're starting to learn now that we can trigger them in certain ways. We can make them into certain types of different, differentiated cells. But of course, we can't practice on humans, so we naturally practice on organisms like this uh, to try and see what kind of pathways uh, these particular types of cells can take if we manipulate the right ones, and also how viable uh, the organism will be thereafter. So as we look at the adult zebrafish, uh, we'll talk about uh, briefly how we select for different types of genes or certain types of uh, chromosomes that will um, manifest in different types of ways in different types of phenotypes. Uh, say, for example, for this particular zebrafish, you see different colored stripes there. We may actually try to uh, develop certain types of genes or turn off certain types of genes that will take the stripes away entirely or possibly make everything a solid color or possibly make the fins larger, or just so they make the uh, particular fish more viable in a certain type of environment. In this case, this would be artificial selection. So using this type of organism here, since it has a relatively short life cycle, uh, relatively uh, easily taken care of in the lab, we can kind of see what analogous pathways we can change or modify to either prevent certain types of diseases happening in humans, or possibly augment certain things that might be more uh, viable, let's say a more sturdy immune system, or let's say uh, trying to reawaken certain types of nerve cells, let them regrow uh, certain injured nerves or pancreatic cells. Uh, anything you imagine that happens in the human body, this is why we research these particular types of organisms to test them out first, to basically see what happens, and hopefully if there's some human trials that we can do later on, uh, they'll be viable at some point. Now, when you take in multiple factors, which organism is the closest to our own, to, the, to humans themselves? It would be the simple mouse. Uh, because of the size of its genome and the way the different metabolic pathways are intertwined with our own, there's a lot of similarities between the two. Uh, this one illustrates a particular gene defect called pivotalism. So if you look here on the baby here, you can see a loss of pigment of the bigger skin right through here, as well as on the stomach through there. You can see a, uh, almost the exact same pattern seen on the mouse here on the abdomen, as well as the frontal and parietal areas of the forehead down through here. So uh, again, because of the uh, ease of growing the different types of mice in the laboratory, although obviously a lot longer life cycle than we see with the Drosophila or the uh, zebrafish, uh, any kind of change in the gene in the, in the mouse is very closely uh, analogous to what we see in humans. So trying different types of gene therapy is done on the mice first, and usually once we see any kind of characteristic that is either suppressed or augmented, we can see the same thing often in humans as well. So this gives us a nice little test subject to play with or to work with uh, to prevent certain types of human suffering. Now, instead of manipulating certain types of organisms, we also have the capability of taking certain tissues to localize certain types of cells they want to regrow into different types of cell lines. So in this case, we take certain type of tissue either from an embryo or let's say embryonic tissue, or even from a tumor, uh, and basically we'll centrifuge the uh, cells and then actually have them grown on a particular, uh, particular primary culture on a petri dish often found with some kind of liquid medium, some kind of nutrient medium. 
and lift that grow until it spaces out to the edges of the particular petri dish. Then each of the cells are removed to grow onto a secondary culture, which can oftentimes be um, manipulated into growth of a certain type of uh, cell structure or express a certain type of gene found within the cell. So basically, if you take, let's say, a fibroblast, which is uh, one of the most diverse uh, cells we have in our own body, which can secrete different types of bony matrix, it can secrete types of cart cartilage, or build uh, different types of uh, filaments found within uh, different types of tissues. Uh, these can be grown oftentimes for, say, a certain number of cycles, like say 50, maybe to 100 different types of reproductions. Uh, but certain types of cells, known as HeLa cells, uh, have been known to be uh, what we call immortal cell lines, where these particular cell lines can be grown indefinitely. So you start with a primary culture, and grow into a secondary culture, and then again and again and again. So you create these cell lines that could be pretty much be manifested in, in perpetuity. Um, but oftentimes, most cells that we take as certain, certain organisms will oftentimes uh, have a end cycle, uh, usually 50, again, to about 100 or so uh, different types of reproductions. Um, but these are all going to be uh, dedicated uh, cells that have already been differentiated. So if you have fibroblasts, then you're only going to grow more fibroblasts. Uh, it's not going to turn into a nerve cell. It's not going to turn into a muscle cell. Now, the key difference, though, is I mentioned before about stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are known as non-differentiated types of cells. So we can actually trigger these by knowing which gene to either turn on or turn off to create, let's say, new nerve cells or, let's say, new heart cells. Um, so that's the basis for uh, your embryonic stem cell tissue is it's not differentiated yet, which makes it one of the more valuable tissues out there for research. Um, but most of the time, you know, you can just be taken out of the original organism without much uh, disturbance in the organism itself. Uh, it can be grown outside the, the particular organism. And as you can see here, uh, we can actually manifest different types of cell lines based on one particular primary type of culture. This is a picture of George Otto Gay. He is attributed to the first person to have a sustainable uh, growth of a human cell line. Uh, he took cells uh, that were from uh, a lady named Henrietta Lacks who had cervical cancer. Uh, they were able to obtain some of her cells uh, with a mixture of, I believe it was human blood, uh, chicken blood, also some, some umbilical tissue to help sustain a distributed line of cells, which has been going on since, I believe, the 1940s or 50s. So about 60 years worth of this particular cell culture of Ms. Harriet Lax's line uh, has been going on strong, meaning that her genome, meaning her DNA found in those particular cells, and these are cancer cells that we're talking about, um, have been able to be sustained for all that time. So the genome that uh, is present today is almost near identical to what we had back 50 and 60 years ago. So it's using this immortal cell line, and the reason being uh, is immortal is most likely because of uh, a particular set of genes that Ms. Serena Lax uh, has in her bigger genome uh, that keeps the tumor cells growing and growing and growing, which we know, of, you know mostly about different types of cancers. They're very difficult to turn off. More of the times than not, these cells grow out of control. Uh, sometimes they even will start to uh, break off each other and then metastasize, remove different parts of the body. So these particular HeLa cells by uh, biologist George Gay have been very instrumental and give us an idea of how these particular cells work uh, what kind of genes are involved and how we can identify them and also help to turn them on or off. Here are some magnifications of the original HeLa cell line from the least magnified at one all the way up to the highest magnification at three. So very simply, if you're looking at these here, they are concentrating this area right through here. And this is magnified again through there. Once again, down through here. So most of these cell lines have been uh, experimented with over and over and over again. In fact, if you try and look up HeLa cell lines or try and Google it, you'll see a multitude of different types of stains and different types of experiments done on this particular line because of its resiliency and its ability to bounce back uh, and continue to grow uh, has been a staple uh, for most uh, experiments done uh, for cancer research, uh, for gene research, uh, and other types of uh, biological processes. Now, as we know, viruses tend to have a very negative connotation in the field of health and medicine. However, in certain sections of biology, especially for cellular biology, they're actually a very efficient tool to see how the particular cells will react to a different, types, a different type of DNA or RNA uh, injection, let's say, of that particular virus as it invades a particular cell. 
the viruses themselves, uh, at least according to this textbook, uh, they do not replicate on their own. Uh, there has been some discussion about whether viruses are truly alive or not, depending on what text or parameters that you use. Uh, they are not, since they simply do not differentiate into different areas. Once it's a virus, uh, it stays an absolute type of virus, although the DNA or RNA may change, uh, but the virus itself does not manifest many differences uh, different than what it originally came with. Um, they do, however, hijack the particular uh, cellular processes to basically make more copies of itself, but it needs a host in order to replicate. Um, so in that instance, in some, in my uh, position, uh, the viruses are not alive, though someone else may uh, differ with that. But I get ahead of myself. Uh, this is known as a papillomavirus. It's a very distinct structure, which we'll look at a little more closely. First, you can see here that you have a DNA uh, embedded within a uh, plasma membrane with capsid proteins. Uh, in some types of papillomaviruses, you can have what's known as a, a spike, which you can see on the uh, scanning electron micrograph right through here. Uh, these are only 50 nanometers large, um, but very simply, these will attach themselves to the target cell, uh, whether it be a simple bacteria, whether it be, C, a, it be a eukaryotic cell, whether either unicellular or multicellular. But watching the reaction of that particular uh, virus uh, and the cell's reaction, excuse me, uh, is gives us great insight of, about how the cells work and how they operate. Uh, but looking at the spikes themselves, you can see through here, you have their spike proteins, which will attack or attack certain types of cells or attach to certain types of uh, markers on different types of cells or plasma membranes, uh, which will attach and then very simply inject the RNA or DNA into the cytoplasm of the particular um, target cell. Oftentimes, if it's simply RNA, simply a ribosome will just simply bind to it and start cranking out more uh, RNA or another amino acid to start the building blocks of the next uh, level of viruses. Uh, otherwise, it can also be injected as DNA, which can uh, make its way into the nuclear membrane and then uh, basically clip itself into uh, the DNA uh, found within the nucleus. So there is a particular mechanism that a lot of scientists will use to their advantage using viruses, uh, using the CRISPR uh, type mechanism, which helps us cut out certain types of genes uh, and basically excise out certain types of genes, which is a form of gene therapy, which in some cases can be relatively simple, but in other cases can be somewhat catastrophic as oftentimes the genes may be targeted for one particular process uh, or maybe say a certain type of step within a long sequence of steps uh, for certain de developmental processes. Uh, but as I mentioned before, the viruses themselves are actually tools uh, that we use oftentimes to inject a certain type of uh, either a faulty gene uh, to force the cell to basically excite it. Uh, so basically to suppress a certain type of activity or metabolic process, uh, which may lead to either relief from a certain type of disease or simply uh, prevent from ever occurring. This lovely picture here is a tumor known as the Rouse sarcoma tumor. So very simply, there was uh, a virus that was isolated by uh, the biologist uh, Peyton Rouse back in 1911 that found that uh, in chickens, there are certain types of sarcomas, which is a very aggressive uh, type of uh, cancer that is caused by the Rouse sarcoma virus. So this virus would trigger certain types of genes, which would allow uncontrollable growth of certain types of cells. In fact, that's what cancer is, where basically the uh, body of the organism has lost control of that particular type of cell and just runs amok until it grows to such a point where it starts disrupting either its surrounding area or it destroys its original tissue. Uh, but very simply, this has helped scientists to figure out uh, what types of uh, genes, known as oncogenes, uh, that can cause different types of cancers. So this has been uh, very helpful in helping helping scientists, not only with, uh, obviously with viruses of chickens, where this comes from, but knowing what kind of oncogenes can be turned on and off can definitely uh, be used for gene therapy for even uh, human type uh, cancers. So uh, even as far back as 1911, we were able to excise a tumor, uh, derive some kind of virus that had triggered the tumor, and then use that information uh, to extrapolate into different types of uh, cancer type treatments, including gene therapies, uh, other types of things. Uh, so again, this has been going on for over 100 years now uh, as trying to uh, use different types of viruses and how they operate within the cell 
and knowing the actual sequence of events uh, gives us an idea of how to treat these particular problems later in the future.